when Anton LaVey decided to use Satanism as the name for his counterculture movement, he knew exactly what he was doing and what impact it would have on the world at large. He understood that due to the influence of Christianity, the gut reaction most people have towards using this word. He also knew that this word was simply a descriptor and that it was changed over time to become the personification of evil. So this is something I've been working on for quite some time. I've been wanting to do an explanation of how a simple descriptive term became something that it is not. Through examining a few passages in the Bible that the early Christian fathers used to personify evil, we will see how Satan is just describing something. And that you can't blame Satan for all your woes. So before we get into it, we're going to have a quote. The best place to find things, the public library. Edward Bernays. If we're going to be exploring the origins of Satan, we should probably look at the oldest depiction of the entity. This can be found in the book of Job, which is thought to be one of the oldest books of the Bible. It contains some of the most difficult and archaic Hebrew. And even the name Job is of ancient origin. The book probably dates back to the time of the patriarchs, which is around 2100 to 1700 BCE. And this was a time where people were living in a very uncertain world. They were constantly fearful of the forces of nature and of the hostile people around them. In the book of Job, we see a man who is faced with great adversity and is having his faith tested by God. So, enter Satan in the first scene. One day the sons of God assembled to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was with them. The ancient story imagines God as surrounded by his heavenly court, and they are discussing human destinies. Satan is one of these servants, as his name indicates. He is the crown prosecutor of heaven, the adversary to mankind. And God's decision to use Satan to test Job's faithfulness is significant because it shows that Job is being tested by the very thing he's most afraid of. In other words, by putting Job in a position, he is constantly tempted to sin. He may or may not stay faithful to God. This is a far cry from what Christianity depicts as Satan. Satan is merely a title given to the entity that is tasked with tempting mankind, not the personification of evil. Now we're going to look at a case of mistaken identity. There's a passage that gets linked to the non-existent evil entity, and it is found in Isaiah. This is from a lamentation against the king of Babylon. 
and it is screwed by the early Christian church to be about a fallen angel. To what depths you have fallen from the heavens, O morning star, son of the dawn! How you have been cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You used to say in your heart, I will scale the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of assembly in the far recesses of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will be like the most high. Instead, you have been hurled down to the netherworld, to the depths of the abyss. In some translations, the word Lucifer is used instead of morning star. This has led the name of Lucifer to enter the Christian myth as a personification of evil. Careful reading of the text of chapter 14 of Isaiah shows that this is not true. This is a case where the early church fathers read something into the passage more than there actually was. They focused in on this small section of this entire text and said it was talking about a fallen angel, one that was supposed themselves to be higher than God. It was with this misrepresentation that Lucifer became one with the figure of Satan and began to develop into the personification of evil. Some scholars have pointed out that there was a saint named Lucifer and that he fell out of favor with the church. And this was meant to soil the name and equate it with evil. Others point out that in classical mythology, there was a Lucifer who was personified as a male figure bearing a torch and he was the morning star. He is often seen as the herald of the dawn Lucifer has very little legend surrounding him, but he is mentioned often in poetry. Again, it is likely the early church fathers would have felt a need to turn this figure into something evil and vile as to make this a diabolical creature, something to be feared. Either way, it is obvious this was a an attempt to make the passage about a Babylonian king, most likely Nebuchadnezzar, into an explanation for the problem of evil in the world. In the book of Ezekiel, we find another king that is mistaken with being the personification of evil. This time, he's the ruler of Tyre. And this is taken out of context. It can be found in Ezekiel 28, 17 through 24. Son of man, raise a lament for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. At one time, you were a model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and adorned with every precious stone, ruby, topaz, and emerald chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and jade. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were made. I appointed a cherub as your guardian. You were on the holy mountain of God, walking amid the fiery stones. You were blameless in your behavior. From the day you were created, until iniquity first appeared in you. As a result of your abundant trade, you became filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you down in disgrace from the mountain of God, and the guardian cherub drove you out from among the fiery stones. Your heart had grown proud because of your beauty, and for the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom. I flung you to the earth, so great was your guilt and I made you a spectacle to behold in the sight of kings. Because of the immense number of crimes and your dishonesty in business, 
You profaned our sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought forth fire from your midst, and I allow it to devour you. I have reduced you to ashes on the ground for everyone to behold. All the nations who knew you were aghast at your fate. You have come to a hideous end, and you will be no more. Again, this is a lamentation against a human being, which is something that God is apparently fond of doing. Again, the king is described to have been favored by God and fell from grace. Once again, the early church fathers saw this description fitting for a beloved angelic being who fell from the lofty heights of heaven to become the personification of evil on the name of duality in the universe. In other words, if there was a personification of good, God, ergo, there must be a personification of evil. So they invented one. Behold, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, Satan, the father of lies. As the myth of Satan grew, there had to be some mention of the being in the earliest days of the world. So the church fathers once again sought out a story they could warp to their agenda. So why not take the creature that led to the downfall of mankind? God's creation and equate it to this evil creature. So we'll look at Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was the most clever of all wild animals that the Lord God made. It said to the woman, Is it true that God told you not to eat of any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But as for the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God said that we must not eat, not even touch it, lest we die. But the servant said to the woman, Certainly you shall not die. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will become like God, knowing that which is good and that which is evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to look at and desirable for imparting wisdom. She took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he also ate it. Their eyes were opened, and they realized that they were naked. They took fig leaves and sewed them together, making themselves a covering. So now, the serpent has always been a powerful symbol in many cultures. In the Semitic world, the serpent was seen as a divine being with the power to protect sanctuaries and borders. The serpent was also seen as a guardian of life-giving plants and was believed to be able to see the future. In some cultures, the serpent was associated with black magic and evil. This is where things get interesting. The creature called the serpent did not lie to Eve. On the contrary, he told the truth. And this is backed up by the very words of God. The Lord said, Behold, Man has become like one of us, for he has knowledge of that which is good and that which is evil. Now we must prevent him from reaching out and taking the fruit of the tree of life, lest he eat it and live forever. So you see, God feared that once Adam and Eve had acquired the knowledge of good and evil, if they ate from the tree of life, they would become gods themselves. They would have eternal life. That is why... Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden, not because of gaining this knowledge, but because God didn't want to have competition. But this just shows that the early church fathers took a story from the early myth 
of the creation of man and equated this low creature in their opinion but one that was very very big in the ancient cultures to a personification of evil thus destroying its good name having established the origin story of satan back in genesis the church fathers continued to interpret things in the bible with the help of some of the writers when the book of revelation was written the establishment of satan as the personification of evil had already been cemented into the mythology so we come to the end of the story of the conflict between god and his mythological opponent then i saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil or satan and chained him up for a thousand years he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him so that he would not again deceive the nations until a thousand years were ended after that he must be released but only for a short time this wraps everything up in a nice little bow showing that the mythical enemies have faced each other for one last time of course like many stories about good and evil good triumphs and as we see in this passage it definitely shows that they were finally totally equating the word Satan with God's enemy, the devil. And this would develop further with Dante's Divine Comedy when he would totally cement the idea that there is an evil entity that is out there trying to destroy mankind and the myth is totally solidified. Now we come to the point in our narrative where things are going to get really interesting for some people. We're going to talk about some of the personalities in the Bible that get called Satan. If you're not familiar with these, hold on to your seats. As we find out about them, we'll start with Jesus calling his disciple Satan. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this, Jesus turned and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! You are thinking not as God does, but as man do. You see, Jesus is pointing out that Peter is being the adversary to what was being discussed in previous verses. Some see it as Peter acting on behalf of Satan. Or the evil one. But it is clear that Jesus is calling Peter a Satan. He's establishing that Peter is the adversary to what he had been talking about. That's merely all it is. Then we're going to go back here to the story of David and see where God becomes Satan. Through the progression of time. One story is taken from the viewpoint of those before the Babylonian exile where they were not exposed to the concept of duality yet. And then the next one is taken post-exile of Babylon where it is established that there is duality because of their exposure to the Babylonian religion. Once again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go forth and take a census of Israel and Judah. Now Satan took his stand against Israel, 
and he tempted David to take a census of Israel. These two accounts are talking about the same census. Yet in the Babylonian exile text, we see God is causing David to take the census. And in the latter telling of the story, Satan stands in as God's proxy. A very loose, very loose look at these two passages would make it appear that God is being equated to Satan. I'm of the opinion that both are orders from God in the story, and that Satan is just behaving as the crown prosecutor once again in the second version. Now we have another little small fun one where God admits to creating evil. We're going to go and use an older text than what we've been using to illustrate this. And I'll explain to you why after we hear the passage. Forming light and preparing darkness, making peace and preparing evil. I am Jehovah doing all these things. You see, many of the earliest translations show God creating all things, including evil in the passage. Today you will see the word evil has been replaced with calamity or adversity or something of that ilk. Yet it still boils down to the same thing. God is the origin of evil. This would make God a Satan to his own creation. We could go on exploring Christian mythology, but at the end of the day, we discover that Satan is just a descriptive term for those who are against something. It matters not if it is mankind, an individual, or an idea. In a manner of speaking, everyone is a Satan to something. That is a concept that many find hard to swallow after being taught all their lives that Satan is the personification of evil. So this takes us back to why Anton LaVey called his philosophy Satanism and what he meant by it. He was saying that his ideas go in the face of all past orthodoxies and that those who took up the mantle of Satan would be the fringe elite who didn't care whatever's thought about them. And it merely shows this when you take it, look at the nine satanic statements, which sums up everything nicely. The nine satanic statements. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Satan represents man as just another animal. Sometimes better, more often worse, than those that walk on all fours who, because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development, has become the most vicious animal of all. Satan represents all of the so-called sins, as they lead to physical, mental, and emotional gratification. Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had, as he has kept it in business all these years. Satan is not the father of lies or the bringer of evil to the world. Satan is the champion of the underdog, the oppressed and the voiceless. Satan just describes what those of us who are Satanists are, which are the adversaries to harmful past orthodoxies and anything else that we may be against, we are Satan's up. 
I hope this has really helped you out on understanding that the word Satan, as established in Christian mythology, has really been ingrained in us to be a real thing, a real person, something, a real personage, a personification of evil, something that is out to destroy us. When in reality, theologically speaking, Satan is a minion of God. And from a Satanist perspective, we call ourselves Satanists because we are the opposers to things. Not because we are agents of God, but because we think for ourselves. That is why we are Satanists. We are individuals. We are not coerced by anything that is outside of us. We make our own decisions. We do things for ourselves. I hope this has helped you out. And if you like this type of format, please let me know. We'll be doing more videos like this, maybe more theological, maybe going into other parts of the philosophy of Satanism. Just let me know if you really like this type of video instead of a live format. I still plan on doing live formats from time to time. One thing I'm looking into is getting together with some other Satanists and we have a panel discussion on topics and give our views as individual Satanists. Remember, all Satanists are different and we each have our own thing. Now, as I let you go, remember to embrace who you are, to live life to the fullest extent you possibly can, and to conquer your perceived world. Until next time, be seeing you.